My name is uh, Rémi Monasso. I'm working in Paris, and um, I was asked by one of the organizers to tell you something about uh, graphs, random graphs. So, um, so I'll do my best. So, but the first question I'd like to ask you is who in the audience already know, know or knows a lot about random graphs, uh, and who never heard about them? OK, you all know something about random graphs. So the, I think maybe the first part of the lecture will be just a basic reminder about uh, random graph properties. And then I'll try to um, introduce some statistical physics approach to the typical properties of random graphs and also large deviations. That means rare events, properties that you see with very tiny probabilities when the size of a graph is large. So, um, so there will be three lectures. The first one, as I said, will be about typical and rare properties of random graphs. So I will mostly specialize to, um, on uh, Erdős-Renyi random graphs, that is Poisson graphs. But I will say also a few words about other graphs with fixed degree distributions, which is uh, not necessarily a Poissonian. Then tomorrow, we'll talk about dynamical processes on random graph, modifying the structure of the graphs and how we can monitor the um, dynamical evolution of these processes. Uh, in an analytical way, and uh, we'll talk about also the replica method. So the first two lectures will be uh, illustrated at some examples of, um, let's say, optimization problems, or I, sh I should say, uh, more precisely, uh, random um, Boolean systems of equations. And uh, so it's a nice example of something which is of practical, let's say, kind of practical interest, where you can see a lot of concepts like phase transitions in random graphs, um, you can see really the, um, whole, how these concepts can be studied and how they, um, they emerge in, in the study of this, um, of this model. And then the last lecture will be slightly different since I'll talk about spatial maps. So it's kind of random graphs in, in two, uh, let's say one and two dimensions. You'll see how I define this uh, later on Wednesday. And we'll talk about spin glass models for storing uh, random spatial maps, which are kinds of, let's say, Hopfield-like models and uh, how they are connected to uh, recent experiments in neurobiology and how um, analytical theories of this uh, static and the uh, dynamical properties of these uh, random spatial map models can be, can be done. So at the end of the, of the lecture today, I will give you one exercise that you are free to, to study or not for next time. And I'll do exactly the same thing tomorrow uh, morning. And then the solution of the exercises are on the web page I just created, which is here. And you find also the lecture notes of, of all the different lectures here. So please have a look at the web page. And if you find mistakes in the notes, I'm sure there are plenty of mistakes, um, just let me know so, so that I can update the notes, OK? So I don't know if you really had time to write down the uh, web page. Yeah, probably. OK, so what I'm going to tell you more precisely today um, about is, um, so I, I, I make a very short introduction to um, statistical ensembles of random graphs and remind you of the uh, basic properties of, of the small components and large components in random graphs. And then um, I'll, I illustrate all these properties in, in, the special, in the special case of the percolation transition on, in random two XOR sat, which I will define later in detail. And then how these, uh, all these properties and more properties can be found back using the post model in statistical mechanics. And how also all these um, techniques can be um, extending to finite dimensions and to study population transition in, in finite dimension. So let me start now. So most of what I'm going to tell you will be on the blackboard. So I hope that everybody can see the blackboard. Thank you. So I will consider two ensembles of random graphs, which are most of the time um, let's say, um, consider only mathematical literature, because uh, for most typical properties of random graph, they, they lead to equivalent properties. But uh, since in the second part of the lecture, I'd be interested in, in rare events, they actually uh, are different. So the first uh, ensemble is, uh, is the following. Uh, so, so you have a set of points, which are called vertices. So n vertices. And in between vertices, we'll have some edges or bonds. So this is one edge. And in the first ensemble, the number of edges is fixed. So this is a fixed number of edges ensemble. So let me call this fixed number NE, number of edges. And what we do, we, do, we just draw randomly the edges among the total set of possible edges. So you see you have the 
n over two pairs of vertices, I will select n e pairs among this number of pairs of vertices, and I will draw edges in between. Okay? So, and each possibility <coughs> has equal weight. So there is a flat uniform measure over all possible graphs built this way. So the probability of a graph in this case is simply one over the number of possible choices of any among n over two. So obviously here n e can be any number between zero and n over two, but I will mostly specialize in the case where the number of edges scales at the number of vertices in the large n limit. So of interest is the case um, where n e will be proportional to n with the constant factor here, proportionality factor, which I call c over two. And c simply is uh, the average degree. This is the average number of neighbors of a vertex here in the graph. Okay? So here, n is fixed. So the Sangan ensemble I will consider is a fixed probability ensemble. So in the fixed probability ensemble, what I do is that I don't fix an E exactly, but I just fix the average value of an E. Okay, so how do I do that? I will consider all the pairs of vertices one by one. And for each pair of vertices here, I will put an edge with probability P. So probability of an edge. Is it big enough? Can you read here or is it too small? Just let me know. Is it okay? So probability of edge will be, which I call P, I will call it C over N. Okay? I just repeat this process for each pair, for every pair of vertices, okay? So at the end of the game, I get a random number of, of edges whose average value will be C over N times the number of pairs of vertices, okay? which is which case like cn over 2 when n is large. So c here is the average degree of a vertex. So I get the same definition for c, which is always the average degree, but the two ensembles are different in the sense that here the number of edges is fixed, while here it's fluctuating. So for most typical properties, when n is very large, it doesn't matter at all, since the typical fluctuation I get here from the number of, of edges are of the order of square root of n which is very small compared to the average number, which is of the order of n. So being in the fixed number of edges or fixed probability of edges uh, ensembles doesn't change anything for typical properties. But if we look at large deviations, that is events which uh, take place with very small probabilities, that makes a big difference. So why are we interested in, in rare events? So there are plenty of physical applications to rare events. So let me just cite two of them. So first one is, for instance, if you're interested in first order phase transitions. So suppose, for instance, you, so you have two different phases, and you may be trapped in one of the, two, of the two phases, which is just a metastable state, okay? So something which is very interesting, if you are in a metastable state, and this is not the most stable state, then you may be trapped in this state for a very long time. So what you want to know, for instance, is the lifetime of a metastable state, how long it will take before you escape and find the thermodynamically stable phase. And this happens through a rare event, which is a large fluctuation co compared to the uh, typical properties of the metastable phase, okay? So it's a rare event, but which is very important because that's something which will eventually take place and will lead you to the uh, thermodi thermodynamical equilibrium. Another example, you can think, for instance, in, in many dynamical processes with absorbing states, that is states that once you are there, then you won't move anymore. So um, let me give you an example in an ecological system, for instance. You have a population, or let's say different species interacting in some environment, and these different species will just eat each other or create each other and so on. Okay, so, so you, you get a system of equation if you want to model this system where you, you have all the population number of these species which interact together. 
Now, what is very important, of course, is that you, you can track the population levels as a function of time, and maybe you will, you will see some fluctuation because there might be some randomness in the system. And obviously, something which is very important to know is whether all the species will survive, or what is the probability after some time t that one of the species, for instance, will disappear, which is called extinction probability. That's something very important in the ecological system. So this may happen through large uh, fluctuations. But you see here, so it's very unlikely that one of the species will disappear. But if it happens, there are uh, dramatic consequences. So the question is not only of, uh, I mean, we are interested in very small probabilities because there are events with very large uh, consequences. Okay? So in the second part of the lecture, this is with, uh, what I will consider. Okay, so we have these two ensembles here. So the two ensembles, have been, uh, as I said, have uh, the same typical properties for most properties, but there are, this one is more, uh, it's more useful in, let's say it's better, more convenient in, in numerical simulations because, you know, in numerical simulation, uh, it's easy to, let's say, uh, if you fix the number of edges, then you just have to draw randomly the, number, the, the pairs on which these edges will come, okay, will be attached to, and that's it. Uh, it takes a time um, proportional to an E, so proportional to the number of vertices. Now, if you do analytical studies, this one is better simply because you have less correlations, okay, because all the pairs are independent from each other. So this one is more convenient from an analytical point of view. So one important property in these two models, and let's look at this one here, is the distribution of a number of, degree, uh, of, uh, of a degrees. So the distribution of a number of neighbors. So let me consider one vertex. Sorry. Yes. Excuse me. If we go to thermodynamics limits, C remains constant because N, E, and N are increasing at the same ratio. Yes. But P will die. Yes, absolutely. P scales like one over N, yes. But I can't, in the thermodynamic limits, P goes to zero while C remains constant? Yes. This is, oh, okay. You can consider the limit where P is fixed then you'll get a number of, of edges of the order of n square, which is fine. It's a well-defined random ensemble, statistical ensemble. But I'm mostly interested in the case of dilute graphs where the average degree of a node of a vertex is of the order of one, okay? So p goes, goes to zero like one over n. Well, I mean, you could also consider the case where p is of order one over n squared. You would have a finite number of edges in the graph when n goes to infinity. All cases are of interest. It depends on what you want to study. So let me consider one vertex here, and this vertex will be connected to a certain number of neighbors just after the random graph has been drawn. And one interesting uh, quantity is the, the distribution of a number of neighbors. So rho of v, so what is rho of v? Then uh, you see I have to choose um, among the uh, vertices, the other vertices here, um, whether I will put an edge or not. And uh, so what I will do is that I will choose, if I got v neighbors, I will choose among n minus one vertices here, which neighbors, which vertices will be the neighbors. And the probability of having um, such a, an edge in between this vertex and the neighbors here will be C over N for each, ver for each edge. So I got C over N times uh, to the power V. And all the other uh, vertices are not connected to, to the vertex I'm considering here. So we'll have a probability 1 minus C over N to the power N minus 1 minus V. And this has a well-defined limit when n goes to infinity at fixed v, which is just a proportional limit. So we get a Poisson law of parameter c, which obviously has c as an average value, which is exactly the definition of c here, the average degree. But we get the whole statistics of the number of neighbors of a node here. So this Poisson law is just a consequence of my statistical ensembles. I could have defined random graphs in a different way, and I would have found maybe different uh, statistical distribution, okay? So in fact, many people have studied other uh, random graph ensembles where the uh, degree distribution is not a Poisson law, but it's any arbitrary law you can think of, 
Okay? So there are other statistical ensemble. with a different law, rho of d. So let me give you two examples. So one interesting case is a case where the degree does not fluctuate. All the vertices in the graph have exactly the same degree, k. So fixed degree, k, or c if you prefer, OK? So these are called, let's say, a fixed number of vert fixed num degree graph, random graphs. Another example, which is very popular, so are scale-free graphs, where rho v decreases as one over e to v to some power tau. So it's a power law decreasing here with some exponent tau for large um, degrees. But obviously, you can define whatever you want. And uh, the interesting quantities characterizing this, this distribution here is the generating function. So let me just introduce two things which will be useful in the following. One thing is the generating function of rho of d. It's just another way of characterizing rho of d, which is just the sum. So g is 0 of x. It's just the sum of a v rho of v, x to the v. So I just built a series whose coefficients here are the different probabilities of having v vertices, v neighbors, OK? So that's a generating function for the number of neighbors. And we can build another generating function, which will be useful when we talk about percolation transition a little bit later today which is the following, which is the number of descendants of a vertex. So what do I mean by that? <coughs> I mean the following thing. So again, let me look at a random graph here, which was built uh, through some process. I'm not specifying the process here to build the graph. I'm just assuming that there is a process which is able to generate random graphs with such a degree distribution here, OK? So I give you some, some very succinct uh, references on the web page. And, um, and you will see that the, uh, a book by Bolobash, Bella Bolobash, for instance, where you, you will find some examples of how to generate uh, random graphs with um, any um, probability distribution for the decrease. OK, so suppose I, I, I've drawn randomly my graph, and I would like to know uh, what is the, um, if I pick up an edge, for instance, here, randomly, let's say this edge here, and then I pick up one of the two uh, vertices incoming onto that edge, so for instance, this one, what is the average number of descendants, or let's say what is the probability distribution for the number of descendants of this, of this node here? So you see, I pick up an edge, I pick up then a node which is attached to the edge, so this node, by definition, is linked to another vertex here, but it will have other, uh, uh, neighbors, which I call the descendants of the nodes. So what is the um, distribution of V prime, which is the number of descendants, V prime? It can be the same distribution of rho, uh, as rho, but it can be something different. So what is the value of this distribution? So you see, when I pick up an edge here randomly, and then one of the nodes, which is attached to the edge, then the probability of picking a node here, a vertex with uh, v neighbors, um, then, oh, sorry, uh, if I pick up an edge and then one of the two nodes here, then I will pick up, yes, this, this node uh, having v neighbors with the probability proportional to rho of v, obviously. But then, also with the probability proportional to v, simply because what I'm doing here is I'm not picking up uniform, I mean, one of the, of, of, an, of, a, of, the edge, of the vertices here randomly. What I do first is I pick up randomly an edge. And the probability that this edge is attached to a vertex of degree v is proportional to v, okay? 
So the probability of picking a node with uh, v neighbors here will be proportional to v times rho of v. Will be proportional to this. And obviously, v prime, the number of descendants, will be v minus 1. So which means that the probability of having v prime descendants which I call rho 1 of v prime, will be proportional to v prime um, plus 1 times rho v prime plus 1. And then that should be normalized. And you, I should sum over v prime going from 0 to, inf to infinity here. And you see what I get here is just the average degree of a vertex in the graph. So this is just v here, which is uh, the sum of the v of rho v, v. So this distribution here will be useful. We will use it a little bit later in the lecture. And you see, it might be equal or it might be different from this one. Because they, they describe two different random processes. One is you pick up a vertex, and then you will just draw some edges from this vertex. Okay, So you will have a distribution of neighbors. The other one is you pick up an edge, and you look at one of the two vertices attached to the edge, and you see how many other neighbors this vertex has, which is something else. OK? So for instance, if I look at the statistical ensemble where all vertices have exactly k neighbors, then obviously this is simply a Kronecker delta in v equal to, t to k. And this is simply a Kronecker delta in v equal to k minus 1, in v prime equal to k minus 1. Now, what is interesting is that if you look at the, um, at the case where the distribution is Poisson here, which is the case of the uh, two ensembles I've, I've introduced before, what will be the distribution here? Can you guess what will be the distribution here for this one? Sorry? Yes, but I multiply by this here. So it will be, again, a Poisson law with the same average degree. In fact, if you have Poisson events, OK, suppose you have a, a, a node here which is connected to this one. Since the, all the edges are just Poisson events, they are drawn independently from each other, knowing that this vertex here has already one neighbor here doesn't tell you anything about the other one. So rho v prime will be exactly the same. Rho 1 of v prime will be the same as rho v. OK, so I will use that a little bit later. So let me go back now to the first um, two statistical ensemble that I introduced. And um, let us try to see what are the, let's say, typical properties of these random graphs. So just to make life a little bit simpler, let's consider the fixed probability ensemble fixed probability of an edge. Which I call p equal to c over n. And I want to describe the um, typical features of a graph. So I will have some, uh, some, some vertices here and some edges. And I would like to know what the um, random graph looks like. So, So here are some examples. So they were drawn actually in the, um, <clears throat> at, with the different ensembles, but I told you the uh, typical properties are the same. And um, here you see just random, uh, randomly drawn graphs, which I obtained for c equal to 0.5, c equal to 1, and c equal to 2. I just did a random permit, uh, not a random, I did uh, a convenient permutation of the vertices, and I put them in the uh, on the plane so, so that no edge cross each other here, obviously, because there is no reason why the graph should be planar. Okay? So it's just a convenient way of, of putting the graphs. So you see, at low degree, you would expect a random graph to be like that. A lot of uh, vertices will be isolated, and uh, you will find also some small components, connected components. So a quantity of interest is how many comp connected components do you have? 
So this is something we will be very interested in. How many of them and uh, distribution of sizes? Obviously, all these quantities are stochastic quantities, but um, we would like to compute the average and also the distribution. Then, um, if you look at very high degree, average degree, so for instance, C equal to here, you see that uh, there might be uh, <coughs> components where we find structures which are complex. For instance, here you see a cycle, which you don't find here in this uh, random realization at low C. So an interesting question is, um, how many cycles do you get in, in, in components? Okay, so components may be three, or they may be more complicated, so trees with some unicycles, or more complicated, here you see two different cycles and so on. So we'd like to know something about the distribution of, of cycles, or let's say the presence of cycles. So what we want to do is to characterize the structural properties of these crops. Okay, so, so what can we say? So let's have a, a look at these properties, a very simple uh, derivation of these properties, which is not a rigorous derivation, but the um, results I'm, I'm going to show you are exact, and they can be proven exactly. So what I will consider is the following thing. So I will consider um, a, a subgraph, G prime, with the vertices. So for instance, uh, an E edges. So for instance, I can consider a case where I've got V equal to four, and E equal to three, which is just a star graph. So V equal four, E equal three, and this graph is labeled, so it means that vertices carry some numbers. One, two, three, four. So it's a label graph. So what do I mean by label? I mean that, for instance, this graph here and this one are not the same. If I change the ordering here of the numbers, then I get something else, okay? Well, if I had unlabeled graph, they would be equal. Just just stars on four different vertices. And the question I'm asking now is how many copies of these subgraphs will I find in my random graph, typically? Or let's say, let's count something simple. Simpler, let's count how many copies will I find in my random graph of this subgraph on average. So average number of copies. Then you see, maybe I will find that this average number is very high, or I will find it's very small, and then it's a way, let's say, to probe the random graphs to see what is inside and what it looks like, okay? Just a simple way of identifying the um, different components, connected components of a graph. So this graph here, I should have said before, is a connected subgraph. So it's made of one single piece, <coughs> And I can go from any vertex to another one through this set of edges. Okay, so how do I do that? So first, I, in order to compute this average number of copies, I must so localize all these copies. So how do I do that? I first have to choose the number, I mean choose the V vertices among the N vertices, available vertices. So we'll have a combinatorial factor, N over V, which is a choice of vertices. Okay. Then I will label these vertices, these V vertices I have chosen, from one to V, for instance, one to four here in this example, and then I get my label subgraph. Now I want to build the, uh, sorry, I get my label set of vertices. Now I want to build the edges, and I will do, I will do that with the fixed probability of an edge ensemble. So how many, uh, how many uh, edges should, should I draw? I should draw exactly E edges, 
in between these vertices here. So that will be done with probability C over N to the E. And I want to make sure that there is no other edges in between these vertices here, which I don't want, and with the other vertices in the remaining part of the graph. OK? So, and this will be done with probability 1 minus C over N to the number of forbidden connection, or forbidden edges, if you prefer. So I've got forbidden edges inside the, um, my subgraph here. And how many of them do I have? I have V times V minus 1 over 2 minus E. <coughs> and then I've got forbidden connection with the remaining part of a graph, which is V times N minus V forbidden edges. So it's a probability. So what I've written here is this part here is just a probability that these V points I have identified, these V vertices, um, will have randomly drawn edges. And at the end, the subgraph which I obtain uh, is, looks like this, this one here, the G prime I have selected at the beginning. The remaining part of a graph will do something else. I don't care. What I want to be sure is that the subgraph which I build from my V vertices will be exactly this one. OK? And then here, I count how many ways I have to choose the vertices. So this is the average number of copies of this label graph. So let's count a little bit further and see what happens when n is large. So I will assume that the subgraph g prime is small, that is v prime v is small. So small means here uh, small compared to n. So it's not a very well precise, well, well defined uh, mathematical notion. You will see a little bit later what it means precisely. I'm assuming it, it goes, it is smaller than anything I need in order to have a well defined um, limit quantity here. So I can, um, so this is the number of copy here, number of G prime. The average number, so a number of G prime. Let me um, just simplify a little bit this formula here. So you see, I can um, approximate this combinatorial factor here by n to the v over v factorial. OK, so this is n times n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on, up to n minus v plus 1, which is essentially n to the v when n is large compared to v. Then I got c over n to the e. And the whole thing here, when v is small and uh, e will be small because e is at most v squared over 2, will be dominated by vn. This is the important term here in the sum at the exponent. So I get, exp and then I will use 1 minus c over n is almost exponential minus c over n. So this is exponential minus c um, v. So let me just write it again as c to the e, c factorial, exponential minus c v, n to the uh, v minus e. Sorry, v factor. v factor. Yes, thank you. OK, so let's look at what happens when n is large. So the only dependence on n is here, in this factor here. So we have, uh, you see, three different cases. Either v minus e is positive, although it's equal to 0, or it's negative. So what can be the largest value of v minus e if I fix v? So what is the largest possible value for E given V? With a connected... Connected component, yes. Yes, you see, if I got a... Tr so the largest possible case for V, if I got a tree, okay? This is the minimal way of connecting uh, V vertices. <coughs> I cannot do something with a smaller number of edges because it would be disconnected. 
And you see, if I got uh, v equal to 2, I get one edge. If I got v equal to 4, I get three edges, and so on. It's always v minus 1. So if I, v minus e equal 1 is the largest possible value for v minus e. OK? And then that corresponds to trees. So if I do that, if I look at this case, I see that the number of copies of my tree, g prime is a tree, will be proportional to n. So I got a large number of them on average. And then I get uh, a number of copies, which will be um, n times c to the v, um, v factorial. Sorry, maybe I just want to. I'm confused about the. Uh, so e is uh, v minus 1, sorry. So I have a mistake in my notes, but it's OK. OK, so I may find a large number of trees in my random graph. And this is typically what I found, you see, in these two small examples here. So one of the questions we would like to ask is, uh, what is the typical value of v I will find? Obviously, I can find uh, trees with um, only two vertices, with uh, four vertices, three vertices, and so on. But if n is finite now, if I got a finite but large random graph, so n is very large but finite, what will be the maximum value of v I will find? OK? So what is the largest tree I will find in a random graph with n vertices? It's a, it's a well-defined question. So what we can see is, so let's look at, at when, for which value of v, this quantity becomes equal to 1. You see, if, if v increases, this factor here will decrease very fast. Actually, the whole thing will decrease, and then it will go down. At some point, this will be exactly equal to 1 over n, and then the average number of trees with the larger value of, of vertices v will be smaller than, than 1 on average. That means that the probability of having this, these trees will be uh, small. Okay, So I won't find it anymore. So before I do that, just be careful that here I consider the number of copies of one particular label trees. If I want to know what is the average number of trees with v vertices, I have it on my random graph, I have to count how many label trees with v vertices there, there are. So on this, I won't do the calculation. Actually, it's the result of a famous theorem by Kelly in 1889. Uh, I just give you the result on this slide here with uh, an example drawn from the, uh, I mean, taken from the Wikipedia web page. If you go to Keller's formula, you find this. So I just copied it from the Wikipedia web page. And the answer is v to the v minus 2. <coughs> so again, you can find con I mean, links to the uh, demonstration of this fact. I won't do that. That would be, take a little bit of time. But here is an example. So you see for v equal to 2, then you have. Uh, one possible uh, tree here with two vertices on one edge, obviously. And then if you take v equal to 3, you see three different uh, uh, trees you can make. So the labels here correspond to the colors. You have uh, three different colors, so labels 1, 2, 3. And basically what you have to choose is the vertex which is in, in between. So th there are three different possibilities, so you have three different trees. So it works so far. You see, 3 to v1 is, is 3. And now, if you look at the number of, of trees you can do with four different vertices, then there are two different structures. Either you get a linear structure this way, or you get a star-like shape. So there are four different star-like shapes, because you choose the color of the, of the vertex in the, in, in the middle. And here, you have to choose the ordering. If you can't, then again, this formula works. So there is a general demonstration, proof of the formula, and I will just use it, and then I will conclude that the average number of trees with v vertices is equal to n times uh, c to the v minus 1 over v factorial v to the v minus 2 exponential minus cd. So now we can answer the question I asked just before, what is the maximal size of a tree? I will find in my in typical random realization my graph. 
So what I want to see is when, for which value of d, this number here, this average number, becomes equal to 1. OK, so d will be large. So we have to be careful here that, yes? Oh, OK. Hello, John. Hi. Nice to see you. OK, so I said d should be small with, compared to n in order to get this formula right. But then now I'm looking at large v. So then we'll see whether the two statements can be compatible or not. OK? Let me push this formula to large v and look at the asymptotics of this formula. So I get n. So now I will have an exponential of v times something. So what is the something? Here, I can neglect v1 compared to v. I don't care. And get a log c. Then I get plus v minus 2, but the minus 2 is not important here. So it will be plus 1. Because uh, plus log v, sorry. And here I got a minus c. This is the numerator. And let's look at the denominator, which is just factorial of v. And I will use Stirling formula. I know that factorial v is essentially exponential v log v minus v plus terms of the order of log v. OK, just turning from there. So you see that a few things cancel. So this one cancels with this one here. And the outcome of the formula is that I get uh, n times exponential v uh, minus c plus 1. Or let's say, let's put the minus in front here. I get c minus 1 minus log c. So you see that for large v, I get an exponential decrease of the average number of, of trees with d vertices here. So that means that there will be a cutoff on the maximal size of the, of the number of, maximal number of vertices, which is when this average number here becomes equal to 1. So v max, we just, v max will be, so let me, I just write this is equal to 1. I take the log, is log n over c minus 1 minus log c. OK? So this is nice, because this is much larger than 1. So it, it makes sense to make the expansion in the case, a synthetic expansion when d is large. But it's certainly much more than n. So all the calculations I've done before, where I completely neglected d squared compared to n and so on, are OK. So the largest subtree, the largest subtree I should find in my random graph should be of the order of log n vertices. And we have a more precise scaling here. So this is what I should find. There should be one copy of a graph with this number of vertices. So you see that this maximum number depends on c. So if c is very small, then uh, minus log c is very large. And log n over something very large is very small. So v max is very small, which makes sense. If I have a few edges, I do not expect the largest subgraph, subtree, to be very large. Okay? It will be log n over something which is very large. But now, if you look at this quantity here, this quantity goes to 0 when c goes to 1. OK? So we expect that, you see, we have a problem here, because then the number of vertices will be uh, larger than n at some point if c is too close to 1, which is certainly not possible, which is because n is the total number of vertices in the graph. So that means that the assumption we have made here breaks down if c is too close to 1. So something takes place when c goes to 1. OK? So everything I did here was n very large, c finite, and then you see that everything is breaking down when c goes to 1. So what happens when c is equal to 1? So I will just give the result, and then we'll see a little bit later how that can be shown or found back, let's say, using statistical mechanics arguments. That when c goes to 1, actually, what we get is that um, we have other um, things which have uh, a lot of cycles. <coughs> okay? So just one more comment before I go to c equal 1. You see, for c smaller than 1, uh, we, we have seen that we have many trees. Uh, but I've not considered the other cases where v minus e is equal to 0 or v minus e is equal to minus 1, minus 2, and so on. So let's do that very quickly. Um, so for v minus e equal to 0, which is the next case here, so how many components do we have with v minus e equal to 0? Then we get a finite number of them, because this is n to the 0 on average. So we'll come a little bit later to that when I, I'll consider the random XORSAT problem. We'll compute the average number of, um, of components with um, um, 
v minus e equal to zero. So what does that mean that v minus e is equal to zero? Which kind of, of graphs have v minus e equal to zero? There are trees where I put an, an additional edge, okay? And then I get a tree with a cycle. So it's not a tree anymore. It's a unicycle, okay? Uh, on the graph, a subgraph with a unicycle. So the number of such graphs should be of the order of one on average, okay? And then if I v minus e is equal to minus one, minus two, and so on, you see that these numbers goes to zero. So on average, I get a, a vanishing number when n goes to infinity, which means I don't find these subgraphs in my random graph with high probability. So I can simply con neglect them. So this is not true when c goes to one, because when c goes to one, then I get the objects which are more complicated than trees. And let me just give you the result, and then we will see what happens when c is larger than one. So when c equal to one, then, um, then we have the, the largest component are not of the order of log n anymore. They will uh, contain n to the two thirds vertices. So I'm not giving any proof of that. We'll come back to this point later, at the end of the lecture, if I've got enough time. But this is a, a, an important result of percolation. So C equal one is called percolation pressure for the obvious reason that for C larger than one, then we get a large component. So the largest component now contain a finite fraction of the, of the, of the vertices in the graph. And this fraction I call gamma of C. That means that the number, there will be one big component here, for instance, which contains a number of vertices of the order of n. And the fraction, the factor here, is a number between 0 and 1, which is a function of c. Obviously, there will be, so you can see it here from this very simple example, but there will be other small disconnected components which have some statistics, like the one we find for c smaller than 1, below the percolation threshold, they will be just isolated trees. So what is the value of gamma c? And how many components do we have for c larger than 1? So here are the curves. So, so this curve here is the fraction of the um, vertices which are inside the largest component, which is called the giant component. So when c is smaller than 1, this is 0, simply because the largest component, as we saw, contains log n vertices. So log n over n goes to 0 when n goes to infinity. Well, when c is larger than 1, you get a number of, of vertices of the order of n. So gamma of c is solution of the equation. <coughs> 1 minus gamma is equal to exponential minus c gamma. And this is what is plotted here. So gamma is equal to 0 is always a solution of this equation. And this is the only solution you get when c is smaller than 1. And for c larger than 1, you get another uh, solution for this equation which is the right value for a fraction versus in, in the giant component. We can also compute, for instance, the number of clusters, so the number of connected components, if you prefer. So for C smaller than 1, the situation is very simple because most components are trees. That means that each time you add a new edge, so you suppose you, suppose you built from the empty graph your random graph by adding more and more edges, so C is increasing. So each time you add a new edge, what you're doing is simply aggregating one isolated vertex to, to, to a tree. So the number of connected components decrease linearly with the average connectivity here, and you get a slope which is two, minus two, sorry, okay, which can be easily understood because each time you put an edge, then the degree of two nodes will increase, okay? So there is a factor two between the, the slope, I mean, the, the, the d or e over d, and e is equal to two, okay? is equal to one half, sorry. So you get this slope uh, minus two. Well, here, when you add edges above the um, critical threshold, what happens is that in many cases, you will add edges to the giant component, and the number of connected components will not decrease. So the decrease rate here, the decay rate of the number of components gets smaller than this one, and you get this, this curve here, this smooth curve, 
uh, going down very smoothly and much more slowly than at the beginning here. So how can we understand in a very empirical way this, this formula? So it's very easy to, to understand. So let me just give a very um, empirical derivation. So suppose you, you, you accept that there is a large component when C is larger than one. And here is the situation of my random graph, okay? With a certain number of, of edges. And now what I will do, I will add a new edge. Uh, sorry, I will, add, I will add a new vertex to my random graph. And in order to make, to make this vertex typical for the new random graph I will, I will obtain at the end of the process, I'm assuming that the number of, of neighbors of this new vertex is, a, is Poissonian. So it's a Poisson law with parameter C, okay? So you see you have this random graph here. You are adding a new vertex with some edges like this, and you are gluing these different edges on the different uh, vertices here. So the question is uh, how will, will the uh, size of a giant component change when I do that, okay? So I can make a very uh, simple reasoning here, which is, um, so what is the probability that um, <coughs> my new vertex here will not belong to the giant component? So what is this probability? I'm assuming that the giant component contains a fraction gamma of a different size here. So what is this probability if I just draw randomly the edges? So what I have to do is I have to pick up the neighbors of this vertex here outside the giant component, okay? And they are just V independent processes. So the probability of this uh, will be one minus gamma to the V, right? So probability that I pick up a neighbor which is not in the giant component is one minus gamma, and that has to be repeated d times. If I constrain to the, this is conditioned to the number of neighbors here. Now, if the number of neighbors v is a Poisson law, in order to get the average probability here, I just have to sum up on the, on the, on the Poisson distribution for v. Okay? So this is conditioned to v, and now the total probability, the right probability that this new vertex does not belong to the giant component, not conditioned to V, will be um, sum of the V going from zero to infinity of C to the V, V factorial, exponential minus CV, which is the Poisson law for V, times one minus gamma V. Okay, and you see what this is simply uh, exponential minus C plus C minus C gamma, which is exponential minus C gamma. But then, if I assume that, you know, if I have n vertices, a random graph with n vertices and n plus one vertices, doesn't change the fraction of, of sites in the giant component when n goes to infinity, it's just correction of the order one over n, then it means that this probability here should be equal to one minus gamma. This is just a probability of being outside the giant component. And I get one minus gamma is equal to exponential minus C gamma, which is what I want. So this is not a rigorous derivation, but you understand. Uh, I mean, it's a very simple derivation, which gives you the flavor of a, of a real argument. So obviously, there are plenty of things we could discuss. For instance, how many big components do we have? So at the uh, critical point when C is equal to one, we may have many different uh, components with <coughs> n to the two thirds um, clusters. But as soon as we are above C equal one, then you see that having more than two giant components will be very unstable. Because it's very likely when, when you add an edge, then you will connect together the two giant components. So one of them will disappear very soon, and you get only one. So the only, this argument, very simple, explains to you why there, there will be only one giant component with high probability. OK. So I think this is basically what I wanted to say uh, about the, um, let's say, heuristic description of random graphs. And uh, just one point, here everything was done with the Poisson distribution, then you can ask what happens if I've got a, a different degree distribution, for instance, scale free, fixed uh, number of neighbors and so on. Then uh, as I write in the notes and you can see on the web, then um, there will be some equivalent condition for C for the average connectivity. And this equivalent uh, condition, which I write here, is the following that you can understand. So you can do the same argument and uh, the argument will be simply that, suppose you have a, 
you have this graph here, sorry, you have this graph here. So now it's not a Poisson graph anymore, it's, a, it's another ensemble, but I can always do my heuristic argument here and add a new vertex, vertex here. So this new vertex will have some degree distribution here, which is given by, by row one, so remember what we derived before. And then the condition will be um, written in this way, we can do the computation, and I, I'm just giving you the result, is that uh, the condition will be that the sum of a V of uh, V times V minus two rho of v should be larger than zero. <coughs> so there are two possibilities. Either this condition is satisfied and the giant, there will be a giant component in the random graph or it's violated, so this, the left-hand side is negative. Then there will be many different small disconnected components in the graph. Okay? And you can see that for the Poisson case, this, you, you find like exactly C11 when you apply this criterion. So I don't want to give more details, but I'm just saying that the same argument can be done. 